Welcome to the ML Platform Podcast, brought to you by Neptune AI, the show where Piotr Nietzsche and Aurimas Gritunas, together with top MLOps practitioners, explore the world of internal ML platforms and MLOps stack components. Today we brought Stefan Kravczyk from Dagworks to talk about learning from building the ML platform at Stitchfix. Model serialization is that you need you know, pretty exact Python dependencies, as you can run into serialization issues. So adding license file and making the repo public but I am talking about making it alive and really open. Was there any case where someone came to you with a crazy suggestion that needs to be built and you said no? Now on to the show. Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, this is Piotr Niedźwiedź and Aurimas Tritsunas from Neptune AI and, uh, and you're listening to ML Platform Podcast. Today we have invited, I think, pretty unique and interesting guest. Stefan Kravczyk. Stefan used, or actually you never, <laughs> I should say you are still software engineer, data scientist. You've been doing work of ML engineer, uh, running data platform in your previous company. You're also co-author, co-creator of open source framework Hamilton. And as I found recently, you are CEO of DAX, DAX Works. Yeah. Uh, so we... Thanks for having me. Uh, excited to talk with you, Piotr Naurimas. Uh, so you have like super interesting background. You have covered all the important check boxes nowadays. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit more about your current venture? What DAX works? For those who don't know, DAG works. So with DAG, D-A-G, short for Directed Acyclic Graph. Uh, is a little bit of an homage to kind of how we think and how we're trying to solve the problem, uh, which is uh, we're trying to stop the pain and suffering people feel with maintaining mach machine learning pipelines uh, in production. Um, so we want to enable you know, a, a team of you know, a, a junior data scientist to write code, take it to production, maintain it, and then when they leave, importantly, no one has nightmares uh, about inheriting uh, their code. Uh, so at a high level, trying to make you know, machine learning initiatives more uh, you know, human capital efficient by enabling teams to you know, more easily uh, uh, you know, get to production and maintain uh, their, their model pipelines, ETLs or workflows. Okay, the value like from high level, right? It sounds great, but there are like, if we dive deeper, uh, there's a lot of happening there around pipelines and there are different type of pains. So if you yeah. like, so how is it different from what is, popular today, like yeah. let's take Airflow as, as AWS SageMaker pipelines. Yeah. Uh, where does it fit? Yeah, so um, good question. We're building on top of Hamilton, which is uh, an open source framework for describing data flows. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, where Hamilton and kind of where we're starting is with replacing, is, is helping you model the micro. So uh, Airflow, for example, is a macro orchestration framework. You essentially divide things up into large tasks and chunks. Uh, but the, you know, the software engineering that goes within that task, right, is the thing that you're generally going to be updating and adding to over time as your machine learning, you know, grows within your company or you have new data sources, uh, uh, you, you want to create new models, right? Um, and so what we're really uh, uh, targeting first is helping you take, uh, replace that procedural Python code with Hamilton code that you describe, uh, which I can, you know, go into details a little bit more. Um, and so uh, the idea is, you know, we want to help you enable a, you know, a junior a team of data scientists to not trip up over the software engineering aspects of maintaining the code within the macro uh, tasks of, of something such as Airflow. Um, so right now, people, uh, Hamilton is very lightweight. People use uh, Hamilton within the task, within an Airflow task. They use us within, you know, fast API, uh, Flask apps. Uh, they can use us within a notebook. Um, and so Hamilton's really trying to help with the kind of, uh, you know, you could almost think of it as DBT for Python functions. So it gives a very opinionated way of writing Python. So at a high level, it's the, it's the layer above. And then we're trying to, you know, build out features of the platform and the open source to be able to, you know, take that, uh, you know, Hamilton uh, data flow definition and help you say auto generate the airflow tasks. Uh, since, you know, to a data, junior data scientist, whether using uh, airflow, prefect, Dexter, Right, it shouldn't really. Uh, uh, th th that's just an implementation detail that doesn't help you, uh, you know, make better models. It's really just a, a something that help. Uh, uh, it's the the vehicle for which you you know use to kind of uh, run your uh, pipelines with. And you said procedural Python code. So, if I understood it correctly, like it is kind of duck inside the duck. So 
the DAC above is, let's, let's say this, what you call macro DAC that would be managed by, let's say airflow, but you're, you're referring like um, Hamilton framework and, and your startup is focusing on more on this job. Uh, so DAC yeah. inside the DAC, why do we need DAC inside the DAC? Like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, because uh, so uh, when you're iterating on, on models, right, you're adding a new feature, right? Uh, you're not going to create a new, because uh, yeah, uh, a new feature roughly corresponds to a new column, uh, right? Uh, you're not going to add a new airflow task just to compute a single feature, unless it's some sort of big, massive uh, feature, right, that requires a lot of memory, right? And so in which case, uh, you know, the, the, the iteration that you're going to be doing uh, is going to be within those tasks. Uh, uh, if you add something new, so... Uh, uh, in terms of the backstory of like how we actually came up with Hamilton, um, so uh, at Stitch Fix, data scientists were uh, which where Hamilton was created. So my prior company that I worked at, um, uh, data scientists were responsible for end to end, uh, you know, going from prototype production and then being on call for what they uh, took to production. Uh, the team was essentially uh, doing time series forecasting, where uh, every month uh, or every couple of weeks they had to update their model to help you know produce forecasts for the business. Uh, uh, so, you know, the, the, the macro workflow wasn't changing. They were just changing what was within, you know, the, the kind of the task steps, right? Uh, but, you know, they had, the team uh, was was a really old team. They had a lot of code, a lot of you know, legacy code. Uh, they had, you know, in terms of uh, creating you know, features, they were creating on the, on the order of a thousand features, right? And so... The, the thousand code, features yeah. manually... Yeah, I mean, so okay, fun, okay. Yeah, like because in time series forecasting, it's very easy to kind of, uh, you know, uh, add features every month. Say there was a marketing spend, or you, or if you're trying to model or simulate something, okay, there's going to be marketing spend next month. How can we simulate, you know, demand type thing, right? Um, so they're always continually adding and updating to the code. But the problem was, you know, the uh, it wasn't engineered in, in in a good way, and so in which case it was like super slow uh, to add new things. Uh, they didn't have confidence uh, when they added or changed something that uh, something didn't break, right? So, uh, uh, you know, hence the, uh, the need to, rather than having to have a senior software engineer on each pull request to tell them, hey, decouple things, hey, don't, uh, that's, you know, you're going to have issues with the way that you're writing. We came up with Hamilton, which is a paradigm uh, where essentially you describe everything as functions, um, where the function name corresponds exactly to an output. Because one of the issues was, uh, given 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 a feature, you didn't know where to where to go in the code base to fix it or to understand it or even know how yes. where it was created. And so the idea was, okay, given a feature, can we map it to exactly one function? Uh, make the function name correspond to that output, and then the function input arguments declare declarative declare. Uh, uh, what's required to compute it. So then when you come to read the code, it's very clear what the output is and what the inputs are. You have the function doc string because with procedural code, generally in script form, there is no place to s stick documentation naturally. Oh, um, you can you can put it above the line, right? Uh, but, like. uh, it's not, um, uh, you, you start staring at a wall of text. It's easier to, you know, from a, uh, a, a, a grokking perspective in terms of just, you know, reading functions, right? If you really want to understand the flow of things, right? It's, you're not overwhelmed. Uh, you have the doc string uh, for extra function uh, for documentation, and then, uh, but then also everything's unit testable by default. So yeah, maybe I, you have a very good testing I... story, right? Um, and so, uh, and then in terms of uh, in terms of distinction between you know other frameworks with Hamilton, uh, the naming of the functions and the input arguments stitches together a DAG or a, a graph of like dependencies. Uh, in other frameworks, so you, you do have... some magic on top of Python, right, to yep. figure it out. Yeah. We would... How about working with it? Uh, does IDE support it? Uh, so IDEs, uh, no. So we it's on the roadmap to like provide more plugins. Uh, but essentially, uh, yeah, rather than having to annotate a function with a step and then manually mm -hmm. specify the workflow from the steps, we short circuit that with everything uh, through the aspect of naming. Um, so long-winded way to say, uh, uh, you know, we started at the micro because that was really, you know, what was slowing the team down. Uh, by transitioning to Hamilton, they were four times more efficient on that monthly, uh, uh, you know, task uh, just because it was a very prescribed and simple way to like, if I want to add or update something, it's very clear and easy to, to know where to add it in the code base, what to review, know, understand the impacts, and then therefore how to integrate it with uh, uh, the rest of the... Uh, Stefan, may I ask you for a tip? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you were able to say like four times more efficient or basically get a, a, some level of benchmark. How to, and I think it is a question that uh, I'm sometimes uh, hearing from mm -hmm. uh, especially ML platform teams and leaders of those teams where they need to like justify their existence, right? 
Yep. So how as a you've been you've been you've been running ML data platform team, how to how to do that? How to know like whether the platform we are building, the tools we are providing to data science teams or data teams, whether they are bringing value? How, how what are the tricks? How to yeah. how to do that? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, hard question. Uh, no, no simple answer. Uh, one is if you can be data driven, that is the best. So. Uh, but the hard part is uh, people's skill sets differ. So if you were to say, you know, measure how long it takes someone to do something, right? You have to, you know, take into account how senior they are versus how junior. Uh, but um, uh, essentially, you know, if if you have enough data points, then you can say, you know, roughly something on average, right? Uh, that you know, we it used to take someone this x amount of time. Now it takes this amount of time, and so you know, get the ratio and the value out there, and then and then you want to uh, uh, count how many times that person that that thing happens and so then you can you know measure you know human human time and therefore salary and then say you know this, this is much uh, savings right uh, uh and, and so that that's from uh, if you're just looking at efficiencies the other way in machine learning platforms help is like you know by stopping production fires so then you can also look at the uh you know uh, uh like uh what's the cost of an outage right and then work backwards like hey if you prevent these outages we've we've, we've also provided uh you know this type of value okay maybe we're getting one spec uh, one step a little bit Back. Uh, to me, it sounds like Hamilton is mostly useful for feature engineering, right? Do you understand it correctly? Or are there any other use cases? Yeah, I mean, so, that, so Hamilton, that's where it's Hamilton's roots are. Um, uh, if you need something to help structure your feature engineering problem, you know, Hamilton is great if you're in Python, uh, particularly like Python, you know, most people don't like their pandas code, like Hamilton helps you structure that. Um, but, you know, with Hamilton, you're not, um, uh, it works with any Python object type. Uh, most machines these days are large enough that you probably don't need an airflow right away, right? Uh, and so in which case you can model your end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline uh, uh, with Hamilton. So uh, in, in the repository, we have, you know, a few examples of that, of what you can do kind of end-to-end. -end. I think, uh, you know, the, the uh, Hamilton is, so, is a Swiss army knife, so you could, <laughs> we have, you know, uh, someone from Adobe using it to help, uh, you know, manage some prompt engineering work that they're doing, for example. Um, uh, we have, uh, Someone, yeah, precisely using it more for feature engineering, but using it within a Flask app. Uh, we have other people uh, uh, you know, using the fact that it's you know Python type agnostic and just you know helping them you know, orchestrate uh, a data flow to generate some Python objects. So um, very very broad, uh, but its roots are feature engineering. But yeah, definitely very easy to extend to machine into a lightweight end to end kind of machine learning uh, model. Uh, and this is where you know where we're excited with extensions to the uh, to add to the ecosystem as to like. Uh, how do we make it easy for someone to say, you know, pick up Neptune and integrate it, right? Um, and Stefan, uh, this uh, this part was interesting because I didn't expect that and want to double check. Like, would you also, let's assume that we do not need macro level pi uh, pipeline like, uh, like this one run by Airflow and we are fine with doing it on one machine. Uh, would you also model, like in this pipeline, would you also include steps that are around training a model or it is more about data no i mean so both so uh the nice thing with hamilton is that you can logically express the data flow so you could do source featureization uh, uh creating training set model training prediction uh and you haven't really specified the task boundaries so with hamilton you can logically define everything end to end and then at runtime actually you know only specify what you want computed uh so you, it will only compute the subset of the dag that you request uh, so but Hamilton what about the for loop of training, like, uh, let's say, so, thousands of iterations of gradient descent, uh, uh, so, that inside... Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, so, so you, you have options there. I mean, like, I want to say, right now, people would stick that within the body of a function. So you would just have one function that would mm. encompass that, uh, that, that training step. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, with Hamilton, we don't, um, you could say, uh, junior people and senior people uh, like it because uh, you have the, the full flexibility of whatever you want to do within the Python function. Uh, it's just an opinionated way to help. I have one more code. question. So I've looked into your GitHub repository where you have this table where people are comparing Hamilton to other tools and it says who, what it is and what it isn't, right? So it said there, it... <laughs> this is something useful, Arima, right? Like yeah. I think we are missing in this space <laughs> definition what's particular to so, tool yeah but uh, doesn't do. getting next <laughs> so to the table a very interesting point that i noted is that you're saying that you are not comparing to a feature store in any way 
However, I then thought a little bit about it deeper, a little bit deeper about it. And well, the feature store is very store the features, but it also has this uh, feature definition, like modern feature platforms also have feature compute and definition layer, right? And in some cases, don't even need a feature store. You might be okay with just computing features both on training time and on inference time. So I thought, how, why, why isn't Hamilton, why couldn't Hamilton be swept for that, right? <laughs> yeah, that was... Yep. Yeah, no, 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 no. So um, uh, you, you, uh, you're exactly mm -hmm. right. I mean, I, I term it as a feature definition store. You can. That's what essentially the team at Stitch Fix built just on the back of Git because Hamilton forces you to separate mm -hmm. your functions separate from the context where it runs. So you're forced to curate things into modules. So if you want to build a feature bank of code that knows how to compute things, uh, uh, right, with Hamilton, you're, for, you're forced to do that. And then so it's very easy to share. Uh, and reuse uh, those those kind of feature transforms in different contexts very easily. Uh, it forces you to align on naming and schema and inputs. So that's so in terms of you know the inputs to a feature, they have to be you know the, the inputs have to be named appropriately, right? And so um, I, I think yes, if you don't uh, need to actually store data, uh, you know you could use Hamilton to recompute everything. Um, uh, but if you need to store a, a data for, for, for cache, you know, you put Hamilton in front of, uh, you know, that in terms of use Hamilton's computer and potentially okay, push so it. Maybe uh, one to more question. Like so I saw also in, uh, not Hamilton, but Dagworks, uh, Dagworks website, as mentioned, you already, you already mentioned, you can train models inside of it as well in the function. So let's say you train a model inside of Hamilton's function. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to also somehow extract that model from a storage where you placed it and then serve it as a function as well, or is this not a possibility? Uh, so this is where you know Hamilton's really lightweight. It's not opinionated where with materialization. So that is where connectors or other things come in as to like where do you push like actual artifacts. Um, and so in which case this is where it's like yeah, uh, it's, uh, uh, at a lightweight level you would you know ask the Hamilton DAG to compute the model. You get the model out and then the next line you would save it or push it to your data store. You could also write a Hamilton function that kind of does that. So the side effect of running the function is pushing it. Uh, but this is where we're you know, looking to expand and, and kind of provide more capabilities to make it more uh, naturally and pluggable within the DAG uh, to specify like, uh, like you, you, your code should specify to, to build a model. And then in the context that you want to run, it should specify, I want to save the model and place it into Neptune, right? Uh, so that is kind of you know where we're heading. Uh, but um, right now, if Hamilton doesn't isn't doesn't uh, res restrict. But could it pull um, the model and you would want to do that? Be used in the serving layer. Yes. So one of the features um, of Hamilton is that with each function, you can actually switch out a function implementation based on configuration. Or, or a different module. So like, uh, so you could have two implementations of, of the function, one which uh, takes a, a path to like, hey, pull from S3 to, you know, to pull the model, another one that you know, uh, expects the model or like, you know, to fit, uh, expects training data to be passed in to fit a model. So there is flexibility uh, in terms of like uh, function implementations to be able to switch them out. So uh, in short, uh, Hamilton, the framework doesn't have anything native for that, uh, but in terms of, you know, so you basically we have flexibility in terms of the end to end, both training and serving. With and Hamilton. That's what I need. Mm. Go ahead. That's nice. I mean, you can model that. Yes. Yes. Mm. And how, what about data versioning? Like, let's say simplified form. Uh, I understand that Hamilton is more on the kind of code base. So mm -hmm. ver when we version code, we version the maybe uh, recipes for features, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean, so having that, what do you need on top to say, yeah, we have versioned data sets? Yeah, um, uh, yeah, so you're right. So Hamilton, you describe your data flow in code. So if you store it in Git, or you know, have a you know structured way to version your Python kind of packages, uh, you can go back at any point in time and understand the exact lineage of computation. Uh, but what, where the source data lives and what it output, right? Um, uh, in terms of data data set versioning, right? It's kind of up to you in terms of your fidelity of like what you want to store and capture. Um, so if you were to uh, use Hamilton to create you know a, a, some sort of data set or transform a data set. Uh, you would, you know, store that data set somewhere. Uh, and if you stored the Git SHA and, you know, the configuration that, you know, used to kind of instantiate the Hamilton DAG with, then, uh, and you store that with that artifact, 
you could always go back in time to recreate it, assuming, you know, the source, source data is still there, right? And so uh, this is, you know, from building a platform at Stitch Fix, uh, you know, Hamilton, we have these hooks, or at least, you know, the ability to kind of, uh, uh, you know, more easily integrate, uh, you know, with that. Now, this is where part of the Dagworks platform, we're trying to uh, provide, you know, precisely a, a means to maybe store and capture that extra metadata for you, so you don't have to build that component out. Uh, so that, you know, we can then connect it with uh, other systems you might have. So depending on your size, you know, you might have a data catalog, right? So maybe, you know, storing and emitting, uh, you know, open lineage information, uh, et, et cetera, with that. And so uh, definitely looking for, uh, you know, ideas or early stacks to integrate with. Um, uh, but otherwise, that's uh, uh, we, we're not opinionated, but I think we can help from the data set versioning is to not only version the data, but give, you know, if, if it's described in Hamilton, you then can go, uh, you know, recompute it exactly because uh, you, you know the code path that was kind of uh, used to, to, to transform things. Understand, understand. So moving, maybe moving a, a little bit back to what you did at Stitch Fix <laughs> and to Hamilton, Hamilton itself. So when was it, when was the point when you decided that Hamilton needs to be built? Like what was the specific problem? I know you already talked about the problems, yeah. but when was it? Yeah. I mean, so back in 2019, uh, so we only open sourced Hamilton 18 months ago. So it's not like a, a new library. It's been running in Stitch Fix for, you know, over three years. Um, uh, the, you know, interesting part with, for, for those who don't know, Stitch Fix, you know, it was a data science org over a hundred people, over a hundred data scientists, various modeling disciplines, doing various things for the business. I was part of the platform team that was kind of engineering for data science. And I was, my team's, you know, mandate was to streamline model productionization for, for teams. So how can we, you know, uh, lower the software engineering bar, give them the, the tooling abstractions and APIs such that, you know, they didn't have to be good software engineers. And then, you know, MLOps best practices basically came for free. Um, and so in which case in this, uh, there was a team that was, yeah, basically struggling. The manager came, <laughs> talked to the manager and was like, yeah, this code base sucks. It's like, we need help. You know, can you come up with anything? You know, I, I want to prioritize being able to, you know, documentation and testing. And, you know, if you can improve our workflow, uh, that'd be great. Which is essentially the requirements. Right. And so, um, uh, uh, at Stitch Fix, we had been thinking about, um, uh, you know, what is the ultimate kind of end user experience or API uh, from, a, you know, platform to data scientist kind of interaction perspective. And, you know, I think Python functions are, uh, you know, not an object oriented interface that someone has to implement. It's like, just give me a function. And actually, you know, there's enough uh, meta programming you can do with Python to actually in inspect the function and know the shape of it, know the inputs and outputs. You now have type annotations, et cetera. So uh, uh, plus one for, for work from home Wednesdays, I had a Citrix had a no meeting day. Uh, I set aside a whole day to kind of think about this problem. And I you know, came up and I was like, how can I ensure that everything's, you know, unit testable, documentation friendly, and the, the, the DAG and the workflow is kind of, uh, you know, uh, self-explanatory and easy for someone to kind of uh, describe. And so in which case, um, uh, you know, prototyped Hamilton, um, uh, took it back to the team. Uh, my uh, uh, now co-founder, former colleague uh, uh, at Stitch Fix, uh, Elijah, also came up with a, a second implementation, um, uh, which was more kind of akin to more of a, a Dagster style uh, kind of approach. Um, uh, and instead, you know, the team kind of uh, liked my implementation, but essentially, yeah, the the premise of everything being unit tested, uh, unit testable, documentation friendly, and have a very good, you know, uh, integration testing story. So with Hamilton, uh, with, with data science code, it's very easy to append append a lot of code to the same scripts and it just grows and grows and grows. Uh, with Hamilton, it's very easy. Uh, it, you know, uh, you don't have to compute everything to test something. And so that was also part of the, you know, the thought with like building a DAG that then uh, Hamilton knows to only walk the paths that are needed for the things you want to compute. But that's roughly the origin story, um, and uh, you know, migrated the team, uh, got them onboarded. Uh, uh, they, you know, uh, the you know, pull requests end up being faster. Like the team, you know, so uh, the team loves it. They're super sticky. You know, uh, they, they love the paradigm because yeah, definitely simplified their life uh, uh, um, than than what it was before. And Stefan, uh, like previously, you mentioned. Uh that you've been working on over a thousand features that so were team. manually kind of crafted, right? Yeah. So is it, and I know that uh, when it comes to forecasting, especially forecasting problems, there are very often tabular data you're dealing with. And, and I also heard uh, around uh, credit risk scoring, where we also have a lot of tabular features that are manually mm -hmm. developed. Would you say that uh, Hamilton is... Uh, more useful in the, in the context of tabular data 
or it can be also used uh, for, let's say, more deep learning type of uh, data where you have a lot of features, but not manually developed. You have you have encoders. How does it? Uh, yeah, I mean, work um, uh, I mean, so definitely, you know, Hamilton's you know, roots and sweet spots is coming from. Uh, uh, you're trying to manage and create kind of you know, tabular data for input to a model. Um, the team at Stitch Fix, uh, you know, actually you know, manages over 4,000 feature transforms with Hamilton. And I want to say... Uh, uh, for one model. Uh, I mean, so, so for, for, their, for all the models that they create, uh, they collectively in the same code base, they have 4,000 know, you know, feature transforms, mm. um, which they kind of you know, uh, can add to, manage, and it doesn't slow them down. Um, on, on the question of, uh, yeah, like other types, uh, I want to say, yeah, if you, uh, Hamilton, in, in a sense, is essentially replacing some of the software engineering that you do. So it really depends, you know, what you have to do to construct the, the you know, uh, stitch together a, a flow of data to transforms for, for your deep learning use case. Um, uh, you know, some people have uh, said, oh, Hamilton kind of looks a little bit like Langchain. I haven't looked at Langchain, uh, which I know is something that people are using for, the, for, for large models uh, to kind of stitch things together. So um, uh, not, not quite sure yet exactly what, uh, where, where they think the resemblance is. Uh, but otherwise, um, you know, very general purpose just replaces, you know, like if, if you had procedural code that you're using with encoders and stuff, then like uh, uh, there's likely a way that you can kind of, uh, you know, transcribe it and use it with Hamilton. Um, uh, one of the, the features that Hamilton has is that it has a re really lightweight data, data quality runtime checks. And so if, uh, you know, checking the, the output of a function is important to you, we have an extensible way that you can do it. Yeah. Have, have something at runtime, you know, check the output. Uh, so if you're using tabular data, there's a, you know, a Pandera is a popular library for describing schema. We have, you know, support for yeah. that else. We have a pluggable way that like, if you're doing some other object types or tensors or something, right. Uh, we have the ability that you could extend that to, you know, ensure that the, the tensor meets some sort of, you know, uh, standards that you, that you expect it to have. Would you also calculate some statistics over a column or set of columns to, to let's say use Hamilton as a framework for testing? Data sets. Like, I'm not talking about uh, verifying particular value in a column, but rather statistic distribution of your, of your data. Uh, so, so this is the beauty of everything being Python functions and the Hamilton framework executing them is, is that, yeah, we have flexibility with respect to, yeah, given an output of a function and it just happens to be, you know, a data frame. Yeah, we sure we could, you know, inject something in the framework that uh, takes summary statistics and emits them. So definitely that's something and that we're when comes to that. when it comes to combination of columns like let's say that you want to calculate some statistics correlations between uh, three columns uh, how does it fit to this uh, function I mean, representing a column paradigm so you can um so the, the, it depends whether you want that to be uh, an actual transform because you could just write a function that takes the input of you know the output of that data frame and actually you know in the body of the function oh, yeah. do that right uh, so you can you can kind of manually do that. It really depends whether you want it to be uh, if, if if you're doing it from a platform perspective and you want to enable you know data scientists just to capture various things automatically. Then that I would come up from a, a platform angle of trying to you know add a, a decorator, what's called sort of something that wraps the function that then you know uh, can describe or and do the introspection that you want. Going back to to a story of Hamilton at uh, that started at Stitch Fix. Uh, so what was the motivation to to go open source with it. Mm -hmm. uh, it is something because uh, curious for me because uh, I've been in, in a few companies and there were always some internal libraries, projects that I liked, but uh, yeah, like it's not so easy and not every project is a right candidate for uh, going open and be truly used. I'm not talking about adding license file and making the repo public, but I am talking about making it alive and really open. Mm -hmm. How, did, yeah. you, uh, how um, did you do that? Yeah, I mean, so I'd been, uh, you could say we had, my team had purview in terms of, you know, build versus buy. We'd been looking at like across the stack and like we were, we're seeing, uh, you know, we created Hamilton back in 2019 and we we're seeing very similar-ish things come out and be open source. We're like, hey, we have, I think we have an, a unique angle uh, of the other tools that we, 
uh, had Hamilton was, you could say, the easiest to open source. Um, uh, and, and so uh, uh, for those who know, Stitch Fix also had, it was very you know big on branding. And so it, if you ever want to know uh, uh, some interesting stories about, you know, techniques and things, you can look up the Stitch Fix multi-threaded blog. Uh, so there was a, you know, a tech branding team, which I was part of, which was, you know, um, uh, you know, trying to, uh, in, you know, from a, a get quality content out, get quality kind of things out. And that helps the Stitch Fix brand that helps with hiring. So in terms of motivations like Stitch Fix, that, that's the kind of perspective of like, you know, branding. So high quality bar, uh, bring things out uh, that looks good for the brand. Uh, and it just so happened from, you know, our perspective, you know, and our team that just had uh, Hamilton was kind of the easiest to kind of open source out of the things that we did. Um, and then I think uh, it was, you know, uh, you know, uh, more interesting uh, that, uh, you know, we built things like, you know, similar to MLflow, uh, config, uh, you know, configuration driven model pipelines, but I want to say, you know, that, that that's not quite as unique. And so in which case Hamilton also, uh, I think is a, a more unique uh, angle on a particular problem. And so in which case both of those two combined, it was like, yeah, I think this is a good uh, branding opportunity. Uh, and then in terms of, yeah, the, the, the surface area of the library is also pretty small. Um, you know, you don't need many dependencies in which case from, you know, uh, uh, making it feasible to maintain, um, from an open source, open source perspective was also kind of relatively low. Um, since it kind of just, you just need a Python 3.6. Now it's, you know, 3.6 is sunset. So now it's 3.7 and it, and it just kind of works. So, uh, from that perspective, I think it had a pretty good sweet spot of like, uh, likely not going to ha have to be, uh, uh, you know, add too many things to, to, to increase adoption, make it usable for, uh, from the community, but then also the maintenance aspect side of, uh, you know, uh, uh, was, was also kind of uh, small. And then, um, uh, and then the large part was a little bit of unknown, you know, so how, how, how much time would we actually be spending, you know, trying to build a community? Um, and in which case, you know, I want to say, uh, couldn't I spend, spend more time on that? But um, I, it didn't seem to be burdensome. And so that's kind of, you know, the, the story of, of how we open sourced it. I did spend uh, a good, you know, couple of months trying to write a blog post, though, to, to, with it for launch, in which that, that took a bit of time. But uh, that's always also a, a good uh, means to kind of, you know, get your thoughts down and get them uh, clearly articulated. And how did you, uh, like, how was the launch, like, when it comes to adoption from the outside? Uh, can you share with us how yeah. did you promote it? Did it work, uh, like, from day zero or... It took yeah, some I mean, time to so, make it more popular. Yeah, so thankfully Stitrix had a, had a blog that had, you know, at least a reasonable amount of readership. Um, and so uh, paired that with the blog, in which case, you know, got a couple of hundred stars in a, in, in, in a couple of months. Um, uh, and yeah, otherwise, you know, tried to, you know, we have a Slack community that you can join, uh, you know, created, you know, um, uh, in so which case, um, you could say, that, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't, uh, have a comparison to, to say, you know, how, how well yeah. you know, it was compared to something else, but, uh, you know, people are, are adopting it outside of Stitch Fix. Um, so UK government digital services is using Hamilton for, a, um, a national feedback pipeline. Uh, there is, you know, a, a guy, uh, internally using it at, at IBM for a small kind of internal search tool kind of product. Um, uh, uh, there's the struggle, the problem with open source is actually, you don't know who's actually using you in production since, you know, telemetry yeah. and other things are kind of difficult. Right. But, um, but what about, uh, pe people came in, what about created issues, asked questions. And so in which case that gave us more energy to, you know, be in there and, and help. Right. So what about, uh, first pull, re out, pull request, useful pull request yep. from external? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, we were fortunate to have a guy called James Lamb, um, uh, come in, uh, he's been on a few open source projects and he's like, uh, you know, try to help us with the kind of the, the, the repository documentation and kind of structure. So like, uh, cleaning up and making it easy for someone, an outside contributor to come in and like, say, run our tests and things like that. So like, mm. I want to say, uh, kind of grunt worky, but super, super valuable in the long run since he, he is like gave feedback, like, Hey, this, this pull request template is just way too long. Uh, how can we shorten it? Like I, you know, you, you're going to scare off contributors to like, you know, in so which case, uh, he gave us, you know, a, a, a few good pointers, helped set up the structure a little bit. So more than one pull request, but essentially, uh, you know, kind of, uh, repo hygiene that enables other people to kind of contribute more easily. I think it's very important. I remember, uh, maybe you remember a project called OpenStack. Uh, it was before Kubernetes was so, uh, got so popular. And basically private cloud uh, type of software. There was a component that was doing telemetry. I don't remember the name of the component, but I remember I really wanted to contribute and fix one annoying thing uh, I was experiencing. But after four or five days, 
setting it up, like I was not even uh, able to run unit tests. Mm -hmm. I gave up. Uh, and so, so it really resonates with me that like making it easy to, for contributor to, to at least test it. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Feels like a great moment to interrupt the show and give you a 30 seconds pitch of Neptune AI. Okay, so we help with model metadata storage and management. That means you can log model metadata from anywhere in your pipeline and see the results in the web app. Organize and display it however you want. Search, debug, and compare experiments, datasets, and models. Save your production ready models to a centralized registry and collaborate on your projects across the org. Oh, and we integrate with pretty much any MLOps stack. Just plug us in. For more, go to Neptune AI or check our docs. They're pretty good. I hope write them. Hope it was 30 seconds. Back to the show. So maybe, yeah, so maybe let's uh, also get back a little bit to the uh, work you did at Stitch Fix. So you mentioned that Hamilton was the easiest one to open source, right? But uh, so if I understand correctly, you were working on a lot more things mm -hmm. than that, not only pipelining. Can you go a little bit into yep. what were the biggest problems? It's Stitch Fix, and how did you try and solve it as a platform team? Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. So you can think. Uh, so the, 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 take yourself back six years ago, right? Um, there, there, there wasn't the maturity and kind of open source kind of things uh, available. Um, and so uh, prior, so one of the things that was happening. So at Stitch Fix data scientists would, you know, if they had to create an API for the model, they would be in charge of spinning up their own. Uh, you know, image on, uh, you know, EC2 running, you know, some sort of flask gap that then kind of integrated things. And so uh, where we basically started was helping from the production standpoint of stabilization, ensuring better practices. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, help with a team uh, that essentially made it easy to deploy, uh, uh, you know, back backends on top of fast API, uh, where the data scientists just had to write Python functions as the integration point. Um, uh, and, and, and so like that helped, you know, stabilize and standardize, uh, all the kind of backend microservices because platform now owned, uh, what the actual web service was, uh, and so, uh, versus each, each data scientist rolling their own version of, of kind of flask, uh, kind of app, right. Uh, so, we're, so you're we're, providing kind of Lambda, uh, I mean, uh, interface not, to them. And, uh, you could say a little, uh, a little more heavyweight. So, uh, each micro, so essentially making it easy for them to you know, provide a requirements.txt, uh, a, a, a base Docker image, and, uh, uh, you could say the Git repository where the code lived and be able to create a, 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 a container, Docker container, which had the web service, which, which had their kind of code so built do and hear, then, do, uh, deployed on do AWS, I hear AWS the template repository uh, pretty easily. Maybe? So, or. Did you call them something different? Uh, no, uh, we, we weren't quite template, um, but there were just a few things that uh, people needed to to create a microservice and get it deployed, right? And so then, uh, what, once the kind of that was done, uh, it was you know looking at the um, uh, various parts of the workflow. Uh, one of the problems was um, uh, model serialization, um, and how do you know what version of a model is actually running in production? Uh, so we, we developed a little uh, kind of project called the model envelope where the idea was, you know, we will actually do more. And so you, uh, much like the metaphor of an envelope, you can stick things in it. So it was like, you can stick the model, but you can also stick a lot of metadata and extra information about it. Uh, and so, uh, cause the, the issue with kind of, um, uh, model serialization is that you need, you know, pretty exact Python dependencies as you can run into serialization issues. Um, uh, the, if you reload models on the fly, you can run into you know, issues of someone pushed a bad model, not easy to roll back, uh, and kind of uh, uh, you know, or at least um, different different. Uh, so one of the, uh, the the way things work at Stitch Fix, that used to work was that models would be you know, if it detects a new model, it just automatically reload it. Uh, but then that, that was kind of a challenge from an operational perspective to roll back or like, you know, test things before. And so in which case with the model envelope abstraction, the idea was you save your model uh, and then you then provide some configuration in a kind of our, our, our kind of uh, UI. Uh, and then we could, you know, give it a new model, auto deploy a new service where each model build was a, was a, you know, a new Docker container. So each uh, service was immutable. Um, and so then it you know, provided better uh, constructs to, uh, you know, push something out make it easy to roll back. So we just switched kind of, you know, the, the, the container. If you wanted to debug something, it was, then you could just pull that container, right, and, and compare it against something that was running in production. 
um, and then it also enables us to kind of uh, you know uh, uh, insert a CI CD type kind of pipeline without them having to put that in, in, into into their uh, model pipelines because uh, common frameworks some right now have you know uh, at the end of someone's machine learning model pipeline ETL is like you know you, you do all these kind of CI CD checks to qualify a model um, we kind of uh, abstracted that part out and made it uh, something that people could add in after they had created a model pipeline. Uh, so that way it was, you know, more easier to to kind of, um, uh, you know, change an update uh, and therefore the model pipeline wouldn't have to change if like, you know, uh, it wouldn't have to be updated uh, if, if uh, you know, someone, there was a bug and they wanted to create a new test or something. And so um, that's roughly, uh, you know, so model envelope was the name of it. Um, uh, and so that helped someone to build a model and get it into production in under an hour. Um, we also had the, uh, uh, the the equivalent for the batch side. So uh, usually, if you want to create a model and then run it, you know, in batch uh, somewhere, you would have to kind of write the task. So we had hooks to you know make a model run in Spark or so or on a you know a large box, right? And so uh, people wouldn't wouldn't have to write that that batch task to kind of you know do batch prediction because uh, at, at some level of maturity within a company, you start to have teams who want to reuse other teams' models, right? Uh, and so, in which case, it was kind of uh, you know. Uh, we were the buffer in, uh, in between helping provide a standard way for people to kind of take someone else's model and run it in batch uh, without them having to know much about it. And Stefan, uh, talking about serializing a model, uh, did you also serialize the pre and post processing of features to this model? How, where yeah, I... did you have a boundary? Like, and, and seconds that is very connected, uh, how did you describe or did you yeah, like describe signature of a model like if, let's say it's a restful api yep. right yeah how, how did you how did you do that yeah yeah so um uh as i said with with so uh, when someone saved the model answer the, the second question first um uh when someone uh saved a model uh they had to provide a pointer to uh, 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 uh an object and the name of the function or they provided a function and so we would use that function introspect it um, and actually, as part of the saving saving model API, we actually asked for what was the input training data, uh, what was uh, you know sample output, so we could actually we could actually exercise a little bit of the the model when we were saving it to actually introspect a little bit more about the API. So if someone had passed in a pandas data frame, we would go, hey, you need to provide some sample data for this data frame uh, so we can you know understand introspect and create the function. Uh, so from that, we would then create you know a pandantic schema on the web service side. So then you could go to you know. Um, uh, so if you use fast API, you could go to the, the docs page and you would have a nicely kind of uh, uh, easy to execute, you know, rest based interface that would tell you what features are required to kind of run this model. Um, so in terms of what was stitched together in the model, it really depended um, on, on uh, since we were just, you know, we, we tried to treat Python as a black box in terms of serialization boundaries. The boundary was really, you know, the, knowing what was in the function. Uh, people could write a function that included featureization as a first step uh, before delegating to the model. Or they had the option to kind of keep both separate, and in which case it was then uh, at call time they would have to go to the feature store first to get the right features that then would would be passed to the the request to kind of uh, computer prediction in the in the web service. So uh, weren't exactly opinionated as to you know where the boundaries were, but it was kind of um, uh, something that I guess we we were trying to come back to uh, uh, to try to you know help standardize a bit more as to. Um, since different use cases have different SLAs and have different needs, sometimes it makes sense to stitch it together. Sometimes, uh, you know, it, 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 it's easier to pre-compute, and you don't need to like stick that with the model. So, um, uh, and the interface for the for the data scientist, like building such a model and and serializing this model, mm -hmm. was Python. Like they were not yep. living Python. It is yep. everything in Python. Yeah, yeah, that was the and, idea. And I, I, yeah, and I like this this idea of providing, let's say, sample input, sample output. Is very, I would say, Python way of doing mm -hmm. things. Like you need, you need testing. It is how you ensure yeah. <laughs> that's 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 yeah that the signature is is kept. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so then from that, like actually from that sample input and output, if it was ideally, it was also actually the training set. And so then this is where we could, you know, we, we pre-computed summary statistics as you kind of were alluding to. And so uh, whenever someone saved a model, we tried to provide, you know, things for free. Like they didn't have to think about, you know, data observability, but look, if you provided the data, we, 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 we you know, uh, captured things about it. So then if there was an issue, uh, we could have a breadcrumb trail to help you de determine, you know, what changed, was it, you know, something about the data or was it, you know, hey, look, you included a new Python dependency, right? Uh, and that kind of, you know, changed something, uh, uh, right? And so, uh, uh, so for example, we also, you know, 
introspected the environment that things ran in. So therefore we could, you know, to, to, to the package level, understand what was, what was in there. And so then uh, when, when we, you know, ran the model in production, we tried to as closely replicate, uh, you know, those, those dependencies uh, as, as much as possible to ensure that at least from you know, a software engineering standpoint, everything should run and, and work as expected. So it sounds like uh, model packaging, it is how it's called today, uh, solution. Um, and and where did you store those let's envelopes i understand yep. that you had a framework envelope like envelope yep. okay but you had instances of those envelopes that were serialized models yep. with metadata yep. where did you store it yeah i mean um pretty basic uh you could say s3 um uh so uh we store them in a structure man on s3 but you know we paired that with a database which had the actual metadata and pointer so some of the metadata would, would go up to the database so you could use that for querying so we had a whole system where you know uh, uh with each envelope you would actually specify tags uh, so that way you could hierarchically, you know, organize or query uh, based on kind of the, the tag structure that you included with the model. Um, and so then uh, it was just, you know, one field in the, in the, in the, in the column, uh, sorry, in the row, uh, there was one field that was just a pointer to like, Hey, this is where the serialized artifact lives. And so, um, yeah, pretty basic, nothing, nothing, nothing too complex there. Hey, Stefan. So it sounds like everything was really natural in the platform team. So teams needed to deploy models, right? So you created envelope framework, then uh, teams were suffering from uh -huh. defining, uh, searching code uh, efficiently. You created Hamilton. Was there any case where someone came mm -hmm. to you with a crazy suggestion that needs to be built and you said no? Like, how do you decide what feature has to be built and which one should not? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what features you rejected? <laughs> Maybe. The... <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, I have a blog post on kind of some, some of my learnings uh, building a platform at Stitchfix. And so um, uh, I'm, uh, you could say the, usually the, those requests that we said no to came from someone who uh, was something, wanting something like super complex, but they're also doing something speculative. Um, uh, so they wanted, the, you know, the ability to do something, but uh it wasn't in, you could say, in production yet, and it was, you know, trying to do something speculative based around, you know, improving something uh, where the business value was still not on, uh, not known yet. So uh, we would, uh, unless it was a business priority, and we knew that this was a direction that like had to be done, we would, you know, we would say, sure, we'll, we'll help you kind of uh, with that. Otherwise, we would basically say, uh, no, like, you know, uh, uh, you seem uh, usually, you know, these requests come from people who, who who think they're pretty capable from an engineering perspective. So we're like, okay, no, you 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 go you go figure it out, and then if it works, we can talk about ownership and and taking it on. Uh, so for example, um, uh, we had the, we had one like say configuration driven model pipelines. Uh, um, so you could think of it as uh, YAML, some YAML with Python code uh, and, and kind of SQL, we enabled people to kind of uh, describe uh, uh, how to how to build a model pipeline kind of that way. Um, uh, so it, it, different than Hamilton, so the more more of a getting it more of a macro kind of kind of uh, uh, way where um, and so uh, we didn't have we, we didn't want to support that right away, but uh, it grew in, in a way that other people wanted to adopt it. Um, and so in terms of, you know, the complexity of being able to kind of manage it, maintain it, we came in, refactored it, made it more general, more broader, right? And so uh, that's where I see, you know, um, uh, a reasonable way to kind of determine whether you say yes or no is one, is it, uh, is it if it's not a business priority, likely probably not worth your time uh, and, and get them to prove it out. And then if it's successful, you can, you know, you know assuming you, you have the conversation ahead of time to like, hey, like, you know, happy to adopt this. So, you know, it's, it's not your burden. Sometimes people do get attached so you just have to be you know uh, uh you know aware as to you know the uh, uh their attachment to if, if it's their baby you know how they're really going to hand it off to you so um uh, uh so something to kind of think about but otherwise um uh I'm, I'm kind of uh trying to think um uh, yeah some people wanted you know some some more kind of you could say tensorflow support um uh tensorflow specific support but uh it was only one person using tensorflow uh they, you know, they, they, they were like, yeah, you, you can do things right now. You know, yeah, we can add some stuff, but like, uh, it, you know, if, thankfully we didn't, you know, invest our time because, you know, they, uh, the project, they kind of, you know, tried it, did it, didn't work, and then they actually end up leaving. Uh, and so, in which case, you know, glad that we didn't invest time there. So, um, uh, yeah, 
happy to dig in it's, more. Yeah. It sounds like product manager role. <laughs> oh, um, very much uh, like that. Yeah. So at Stitch Fix, we didn't have product managers. Uh, so the organization that had product managers. So I was, you know, my team. We were we were our own product managers. Um, uh, so would have, you know, you could say so. You could, that's where I spent, you know, some of my time is yeah, trying to talk to people, managers, ICs, understand pain points, but also understand, you know, what's what's going to be valuable from business and where we should be kind of, uh, you know, spending time. So, I think the challenging part. I'm I'm running product at Neptune, and and it is, it is a good thing, and at the same time challenging that you're dealing with people who are technically savvy. Uh, they're engineers, they can code, they, mm -hmm. they, they can think in an abstract way. So very often what you hear the first, like the first iteration, the feature request is actually solution. Yep. You don't hear the problem, right? Yep. So I, li I like this test and maybe other uh, ML platform yep. teams can learn from it. Do you have it on production? Is it something that works or is it something that you plan to, <laughs> to yep. move to production one day uh, as a first filter? Yep. Um, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I like this. <laughs> I mean, actually, so, so, you know, I mean, you brought back memories. Like, yeah, there's, a, there's a, hey, can you do this? Okay, so what's the problem? Yeah, that is, that is actually, that is the one thing you have to learn uh, to, to be your first reaction whenever someone uh, is using your platform. Asks is like, yeah, what is, what is the actual problem? Because it could be that they're, uh, you know. Uh, trying to, they, they found a hammer and they want to, they want to, you know, use that particular hammer for that particular task. But really, um, uh, so for example, yeah, like uh, we had a, uh, they want to do hyper parameter op optimization. They were asking for it for uh, like, can you do it this way? And but stepping back, we were like, hey, we can actually do it at a little higher level, so you don't have to think at this kind of, you don't, we don't, wouldn't have to engineer it. And so, in which case, super important question to always ask, yeah, what is what is the actual problem you're trying to solve? And therefore, you know, uh, and therefore then you can kind of then also ask, yeah, what is the business value? How important is this, etc., to really know like how to prioritize it. So we have learned how you, how you've been dealing with data scientists coming to you <laughs> for features. Uh, how the the like the uh, second part of the communication work? How did you encourage or make people teams follow what you've developed? What what yeah. what you propose them to do? How did yeah. you set the standards in the organization? Yeah. Um, so ideally, with any initiative we had, we found a, a particular use case, a narrow use case, or a team who needed it and would adopt it and would use it when we when we kind of uh, uh, you know developed it. Nothing worse than developing something and no one using it. Uh, that looks bad. You know, managers like who's using yeah. it? You know. Uh, so one is ensuring that you have a clear use case and someone who has the need and wants to partner with you. Um, and then only once that's successful, we'll start to think about broadening it. Because uh, one, you can use them as like the use case and story. Uh, so this is where ideally you have, you know, weekly, bi-weekly share outs. So we had uh, what was called algorithms, uh, uh, like you said, beverage minute, where essentially you could get up for a couple of minutes and kind of talk about things. And so, yeah, definitely had to live the dev tools evangelization internally because that's Stitch Fix. Uh, you know, it wasn't the data scientists, you know, had the choice to not use our tools if they didn't want to, if they wanted to engineer things themselves. So we had to, you know, definitely go around the route of like, we can take the, these pain points off of you. You know, you don't have to think about them. Here's here's what we've built here's a use you know here's someone who's using it and they're using it for this particular use case um i think you know so therefore awareness is, is a big one right you got to make sure you know people know about the solution that, that that it is an option um uh documentation so we actually had a little tool um that enabled you to write sphinx docs pretty easily um so that was kind of you know uh, something that we ensured that for every kind of you know, model envelope other tool we kind of built you know hamilton we we had kind of a sphinx docs uh set up so if people wanted to like we could point them to the documentation try to show snippets and things um uh the other is uh from our experience and the kind of the telemetry that we put in um uh so one nice thing about platform is that you know we can put in as much telemetry as we want so we actually uh, uh when everyone someone was using something uh, and there was an error you know, we would we would get a slack slack alert on it, and so we would try to be um, you know on, on top of that and like ask them and go like, what are you doing? Like maybe and so trying to engage them to ensure that they were successful and kind of doing things correctly. Uh, you can't do that with open source, unfortunately. People, you know, it's slightly invasive. Um, uh, but um, otherwise, you know, uh, most people are only willing to kind of adopt things, you know, maybe a couple of times a quarter, right? And so it's just you know you need to have the thing in the right place, right time. Uh, for them to kind of, w when they have that moment to be able to get started over the hump, since, you know, getting started is, is, is the biggest challenge. And so therefore trying to, you know, find the documentation examples and ways to kind of uh, make been... that as, as small as uh, a jump as possible. And what was the... So have you been oh, in Stitch sorry. Fix from the oh, very beginning of ML platform or did it evolve? 
from the very beginning, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah. When I got there, it was yeah, uh, a pretty basic small team. Uh, uh, and in terms of yeah, do, do you know how there, it was for, created? Uh, why yeah, it was decided product. that it's correct time to actually have a platform team? Uh, so, uh, uh, no, I don't answer, know the answer to that, but um, uh, the, the two guys are kind of hit up uh, Eric Colson and Jeff Magnuson. Uh, you know, Jeff Magnuson has a pretty famous post around, you know, engineers shouldn't write ETL. If you Google that, you'll, you'll see this kind of post that kind of describes the philosophy of like Stitch Fix, where, you know, the, uh, we wanted to create full stack data scientists where uh, if they can do everything end to end, they can do things move faster and better. But, you know, uh, with that thesis, though, there's a certain scale limit you can't hire. It's hard to hire everyone who has all the skills to do everything full stack, you know, data science, right? And so, in which case, um, uh, it was really their vision that, like, hey, a platform team to build tools of leverage, right? Um, I think, uh, you know, it's something, I don't know what uh, data you have, but, like, my uh, cursory knowledge around, you know, machine learning initiatives is generally there's a, a, a ratio of engineers to data scientists of, like, one to one or one to two, Um uh, but at Stitch Fix, you know, we the uh, the ratio of say if, uh, if you just take the engineering uh, the platform team that was focused on you know helping pipelines, right? The ratio was closer to one to ten. Um, and so in terms of just like leverage of like you know engineers to what data scientists can kind of do, I think uh, you it does a little uh, uh, you know you, you have to understand what a platform does. Now then you also have to know how to communi communicate it. So given your your earlier question, Piotr, about like how do you measure effectiveness of platform teams? In which case. Um, you know, they, I don't know what conversations they had to, to, to get headcount, uh, but essentially, yeah, you do need a little bit of um, uh, help uh, uh, or at least like uh, thinking in, in terms of communicating that like, hey, yes, this team is going to be second order because, you know, we're not going to be directly impacting uh, and producing a, a feature, but if we can make the people more effective and efficient who are doing it, uh, and then you see you know, it's going to be worth it. Engineers and aspect. data scientists, do you, uh, do you assume that machine learning engineer is an engineer or... He's more of a, or she's more of a data science. I, 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 yeah, I can't, them, you know, the distinction between a data scientist and machine learning engineer is you could say one, maybe you could say has a connotation. They mm -hmm. do a little bit more online kind of things. Right. And so they need to do a little bit more engineering, but I see, I think there's a pretty small gap. Um, uh, you know, for me, you know, actually I like my hope is that if when people use Hamilton, we enable them to do more, they can actually switch the title from data scientist to machine learning engineer. <laughs> Um, but um, otherwise, I, I kind of lump them into uh, the data scientist bucket okay. in that regard. And did, so, like, did you see any evolution in like. how teams were structured throughout your years at Stitch Fix? Did you change the composition of these end-to-end -end machine learning teams composed of data scientists and engineers? Uh, it, it really depended on their, uh, on their problem. Because some, like, say, the forecasting teams, they were very much an offline batch work fine. They didn't have to know, you know, uh, engineer anything too complex from an online perspective. But more than, you know, the personalization teams where, you know, SLAs and client-facing things started to matter, they definitely started hiring towards, you know, people with a little bit more experience there since they did kind of help from, uh, you know, much like, uh, uh, you know, we, we're not tackling that yet, I would say, but like, you know, we're, we're, with Dagworks, we're trying to enable, you know, a lower uh, software engineering bar for to build and maintain model pipelines. Uh, I wouldn't say recomm the recommendation stack and producing recommendations online. Uh, there isn't anything that's kind of you know simplifying that, and so in which case you just still need you know a stronger engineering skill set to ensure that over time you you know if you're managing a lot of microservices that are talking to each other or you're managing you know, SLAs, you do need you know a little bit more engineering knowledge to kind of do well. And so in which case, if, if anything, that was the the split that kind of started to emerge. So anyone who's doing more client facing SLA uh, required stuff was slightly stronger on the software engineering side. Else, everyone was you know was was fine to be. And great when it comes to roles with, with lower software. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, when, when, it comes to roles, about... when it comes to roles that are not necessarily technical, Go ahead, uh, would you embed them into those intent ML teams like uh, project managers or subject matter experts, or is it just plain so, uh, data scientists? Uh, I mean, so some of it was you know, landed on the shoulder of the data scientist team as to like partner, who, who they're partnering with, right? And so uh, they were generally partnering with someone within the organization, in which case, you know, you could say, uh, you know, collectively between the two, they're, they're product managing um, uh, something. So we didn't have didn't have explicit product manager roles. I think at the scale when Stitch Fix started to grow, it was really like project management was 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 a pain point of like how do we bring that in? Who does that? Right. Um, so it really depends on the scale of, of kind of the the, the the product is what you uh, what it's what you're doing, what it's touching, as to like whether you, you start to need that. Um, 
but uh, yeah, definitely something that uh, the, t the the org was thinking about. You know, when I was still there, is like, yeah, how do you structure things to run more efficiently, and effectively, and like, yeah, who who how exactly do you uh, draw the bounds of uh, you know a team delivering a machine learning? So uh, so if you're working with the uh, inventory team who's managing inventory in a warehouse, for example, you know, like uh, uh, what is what is the, the team structure there was still being kind of you know uh, shaped out. Right when I was there, it was uh, very separate. Uh, but they they had you know they worked together, but they were uh, different managers, right? Uh, kind of reporting to each other, but they worked on the same initiative. So. Uh, uh, worked well when we were small. Um, uh, you'd have to ask someone there now as to like, yeah, what's happening. But otherwise, um, uh, yeah, I would say, yeah, it depends on the size of the org company and importance of the machine learning initiative. And uh, I wanted to ask about moni mo uh, monitoring of the models on production, making them alive, because it sounds like pretty similar to software space. Okay, like they, data scientists are. Here would be software engineers. Uh, ML platform team can be for the DevOps team. Mm -hmm. What about SR, uh, SRIs, SRIs, people who are yeah. making sure that it is alive? And yep. how did it work? And yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so um, uh, with with model envelope, and we so we deployed the we you know provided deployment for free. Uh, so that meant uh, the data scientists, you could say the only thing they were responsible was for the model. Um, and we tried to structure things in a way that like, hey, bad models shouldn't reach production because we have enough of a CI validation step that like the model, uh, uh, you know, shouldn't be an issue. Um, and so the only thing, the thing that, that would break in production is a infrastructure changes, in which case the data scientist isn't responsible and capable for, yes. but otherwise, you know, the, uh, uh, if there were, so therefore if there were, um, so it was our job to kind of like my team's responsibility i think we were on call for something like you know over 50 services because that's how many models were deployed with us and we were frontline so we were frontline precisely because you know most of the time if something was going to go wrong it was likely going to be something to do with infrastructure so we were first point yeah. but like they were also on the call chain um, um, uh, uh, or at least like when we actually well i'll step back once we once we when any new model was deployed we were both on call uh, just to make sure that you know it deployed and it was you know running initiative but then it would you know, slightly uh bifurcate as to like you know okay we, we would do the first escalation because if it's infrastructure you can't do anything but otherwise you need to be on call because you know if the model is actually doing some some weird predictions you know we can't fix that in which case you're the person who has to like help debug and uh, diagnose sounds it. like something with data right data drift yeah mm. data drift um something upstream uh etc and so this is where uh you know better model observability uh and kind of data observability helps um, so trying to capture it and, and use that, so there's many different ways, but the nice thing with, uh, uh, what we had set up is that we were in, in a good position to be able to, um, uh, you know, capture, uh, inputs at training time, but then also because we controlled the web service, uh, you know, and what was the internals, we could actually log and emit things, uh, that came in. So then we could, you know, uh, we had pipelines yeah. in to kind of build and, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, reconcile, uh, so if you want to ask the question, is there training serving SKU? Uh, you as a data scientist or machine learning engineer didn't have to build that in. You just had to turn on logging in your service. And then like, then we had like, uh, turn on some other configuration downstream, but then, you know, yeah. we, we provided a way that you could, um, uh, you know, uh, push it to, uh, an, an observability solution to then, you know, compare, uh, production features versus training features. Sounds like provided very comfortable <laughs> interface for your data scientists. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's the idea. I mean, so truth be told, that's kind of what I'm trying to replicate with Dagworks, right? Pro provide the abstractions to allow anyone to have that experience we build at Stitchfix. But um, uh, yeah, so uh, data scientists hate migrations. Uh, and so part of the reason why to focus on an API thing is to be able to, you know, if we wanted to change things underneath from a platform perspective, you know, we wouldn't be like, hey, data scientists, you need to migrate, right? And so uh, that was also part of the idea of why we focus so heavily on these kind of API boundaries. So we could also make our lives simpler, uh, but then also theirs as well. And uh, can you share how big was the team of data scientists and ML platform team when it comes to number of people? At the time when you work at Stitch Fix, like it was around, you know, I think at its peak was like 150 um, was total data scientists and platform together. Um, uh, and the split was one to ten. 
Ah, uh, yeah, so, so, so it was, um, so the, the, so we had a, a platform team, I think we roughly, it was like well, either one to four, one to five total, because we had a whole platform team that was help, helping with UIs, a whole platform team focusing on um, uh, uh, the uh, microservices and kind of online architecture, right? Uh, so not, not pipeline related. Um, and so, uh, yeah. Uh, and so there was more, you could say, work required from an engineering perspective from like yeah, integrating like you know, APIs, machine learning, other stuff in the business. So uh, like the, the, whole, the, 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 yeah, the actual ratio was, you know, one to four, one to five. But that's because, you know, there was a large component of the platform team that was helping with like yeah, doing, doing more um, uh, things around yeah, building platforms to kind of help integrate, debug machine learning recommendations. But what, what were the sizes uh, of... Uh... Intent machine learning teams probably not hundred uh, people in the single team, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. So they were, um, yeah, as I said, it kind of varied. Um, uh, you know, like eight to ten. Um, uh, some teams it's were that big, large, right? uh, others were five, right? You know, so really, um, it really depended on the vertical and 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 kind of who they were helping with with respect to the business. So you can think of um, uh, it roughly almost scaled on the modeling. So. Uh, if you, we were in the UK, we're, uh, it was just in the UK and the US, and then there were different business lines. There was, you know, uh, men's, women's kind of kids, right? And so there was, you could think of like potentially data scientists on each, on each one, on each kind of combination, right? So it really depended, uh, where that was needed or not, but like, yeah, anywhere from like teams of three to like, yeah, like eight to 10. And Stefan, what, uh, because there is a lot of, uh, information and content, how to become data scientists, uh, but there is order of magnitude less around being MLOps engineer or a member of a ML platform team. What do you think is needed for a person to be valuable member of ML platform team? And what is the team, typical ML platform team composition? What type of people yeah. you need to have? Yeah. Um, so I'm, so I'm, my bias is, yeah, you, uh, you've been, yeah, you, yeah, like you, you have, you are kind of unicorn, but, but there are not so many people no, like I mean, you. So I, I think it, um, so you, you know, you need to have empathy for, you know, what people are trying to do. So I think if you have done a bit of machine learning, done a little bit of modeling, it's, you know, it's not like when someone says, so when someone comes to you with a thing, you can ask, what are you trying to do? You have a bit more understanding. Oh, at a high level, like, you know, what, what can you do? Right. Uh, and then um, having built things yourself and lived the pains, it definitely you know, helps with that empathy. Uh, so if you're an ex operator, I think, you know, that's kind of you know, where my path was. I was, you know, uh, I built models. I realized I liked less building the actual models, but the infrastructure around to ensure that people, you know, can, can do things effectively and efficiently. Um, uh, so yeah, having, um, uh, I would say the, the skill set may be slightly changing from what it was six years ago to now, just because there's a lot more maturity in open source and kind of the vendor market. So, you know, there's, there's a bit of a, uh, a meme or trope of, uh, uh, with ML ops, it's vendor ops. So, uh, so you need, <laughs> uh, uh, if you're going to integrate and bring in, you know, solutions that you're not building in house, right. Then you need to mm -hmm. you know, understand a little bit more, uh, you know, about abstractions and like, what do you want to control, uh, versus, versus, you know, tightly integrate. Um, so yeah, empathy. So having some background and then the software engineering skill set that you've built things to kind of, uh, in my blog post, I kind of, I, I, I frame it as a two layer API. Uh, so. Uh, you should never ideally expose the vendor API directly. You should always have a, a, a you know a, a wrap of veneer around it so that you control some aspects so that you know you, the people you're providing the platform for don't have to make decisions. So for example, you know where where, where should the artifact be stored like for uh, for the save file like that should be something that you as a platform you know uh, take care of even though that could be something that's required uh, from the API the vendor API to kind of be provided. You can kind of you know make make that decision. And so this is where I kind of say. Um, uh, yeah, like if you've lived the experience of managing, maintaining vendor APIs, you, you know, you're going to be uh, a little better at it the, the next time around. Um, but, but otherwise, yeah. Um, uh, and then if you have a, a DevOps background as well, or like had built things to deploy yourself to so work in smaller places, then you also can kind of understand the, the production implications and like uh, the tool set available of what you can integrate with. Um, since, you know, you, you could get a, a pretty reasonable way with Datadog just on, you know, service deployment, right? But if you want, you know, uh, really understand what's within the model, you know, why training serving SKU is important uh, to understand, right? Then, yeah, having uh, uh, having seen it done, 
having some of the empathy to understand why you need to do it, then I think leads you to just, you know, um, if you have the bigger picture of how things fit end to end, I think, uh, you know, the macro picture, I think then that helps you make better micro decisions. Uh, Stefan, a question, uh, because I think when it comes to, when it comes to uh, topics we wanted to cover, we are doing pretty well. I like, I'm looking at the, at the, let's call it agenda. Uh, is there anything we should ask or you would like to, you know, ask to ask and, and talk? I think um, one of, like my, in terms of the, the future, right? Like I think um, uh, to me, Stitch Fix was kind of avant-garde in that six years ago. It tried to, you know, enable data scientists to do things end to end. And kind of the way that I interpreted it is that uh, if you enable data practitioners in general uh, to be able to do more self-service, more end-to-end -end work, uh, you know, uh, they can take business domain context and, you know, create something that iterates all the way through. Uh, to, and, they, and so therefore they have a, a better feedback loop to understand whether, um, you know, it, 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 it's valuable or not. Rather than, I think, more traditional where people are still in this kind of handoff model. Um, uh, and so which case, like, uh, there, there's, there's a bit of the then, you know, who, who are you designing tools for uh, kind of question. Um, uh, so are you trying to, you know, target engineers, machine learning engineers, like, you know, um, um, uh, with, with these kind of solutions. Uh, but then does that mean the data scientist has to become a software engineer to be able to use your solution to, uh, to do things self-service? Um, uh, you know, there is the, the, the other extreme, which is the low code, no code. Uh, but I think that's kind of limiting, you know, most of those solutions are SQL or some sort of d custom DSL, which I don't think lends itself well to kind of, um, you know, taking knowledge or taking learning a skill set and then applying it, going into another job. It's not necessarily, that only works if they're using the same tool. Right. Um, and so I like my, my kind of belief here is that like, if we can simplify the tools, the software engineering kind of abstractions required. Then you know we can we can better you know, enable this kind of self service paradigm that also makes it easier for platform teams to also kind of manage things. And hence why I was saying like if you um, you know take a vendor and you can simplify the API, you can actually you can actually make it easier for a data scientist to use, right? And so that is um, uh, kind of where, where where my thesis is is that like uh, yeah, we if we can make it uh, you know lower the software engineering bar to do more self service, you're going to provide more value because that same person can get more done. But then also, uh, if, if it's constructed in the right way, you're also going to, you know, this is where the thesis with, with, with Hamilton is and kind of DAGWorks uh, uh, that you can kind of, you know, uh, more easily maintain things over time so that when someone leaves, uh, it's not, <laughs> no one has nightmares inheriting things, um, uh, where, which is, you know, really where, um, like at Stitch Fix, like we made it really easy to get to production, but teams, you know, because the business moves so quickly and other things like could spend half their time trying to keep machine learning pipelines afloat. And so this is where I think, you know, uh, and that's some of the reasons why was because we enable them to do more, too, too much engineering. Right. And so things with esoteric. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, yeah. Okay. I'm curious to hear, what do you guys think in terms of, uh, uh, yeah, who, who should be the ultimate target for kind of, you know, uh, the, the level of software engineering skill required to enable self-service, you know, model building. Uh, what what do you mean lines, specifically right? by this question? So, I mean, so, uh, yeah, uh, ah. is self-service the future? Uh, if so, what is, what is, the, what is that software engineering skill set required? At least how I see it in the future, uh, self-service is the future, first of all, but then I don't really see, at least from experience, that there are platforms right now that uh, data scientists themselves could work against end to end. As I've seen in my experience, there are always a need for a machine learning engineer who basically is still in between data scientists and the platform, unfortunately, but mm -hmm. definitely there should be a goal probably that a person who has a skill set of a current data scientist could be able to do end to end. That's what I believe. I think it is getting, uh, that is kind of a race. Uh, so things that used to be hard uh, six years ago are easy today, but at the same time, techniques got more complex. Like we have, okay, today, uh, super, <laughs> uh, super sexy uh, topic, uh, foundational models, uh, encoders, your, the models we are building on, are more and more dependent on the other services. 
-hmm. and this abstraction is will not be any more you know data sets some pre-processing training post-processing uh, package model packaging and and then uh, independent uh, web service right it is getting more and more depending also on the external services so um, i think that the goal yes of course like if we if we are repeating ourselves and it's and we will be repeating ourselves let's make it self -ser uh, self service uh, uh, friendly but but i think with the development uh, of the techniques and methods in this space uh, it will be kind of a race. So some will solve some things, but we will introduce another complexity. And uh, w especially when you're building something, when you're trying to do something state of the art, you're not thinking about making things simple to use at the beginning. Rather, you're thinking about, okay, whether we will be able to, to do it, right? Mm -hmm. So the new techniques usually are not so... Uh, friendly yeah. and easy to use yeah i was gonna well, i was gonna say or at least uh, jump over what he's saying that um uh in terms of one of the techniques i use for designing apis um is really actually trying to mm -hmm. uh design the api first uh before uh you know i think what Piot was saying is very easy for an engineer i found this you know problem myself is to go bottoms up it's like i want to build this capability mm -hmm. and then i want to expose how people kind of use it and i actually think inverting that and going you know, what is, what is the experience uh, that I want someone to kind of use uh, or, or get from the API uh, first and then go down is really, um, it has been a very enlightening experience as to like, how could you simplify what you could do? Because it's very easy, yeah, um, yeah from bottoms up to like include all these concerns because you, you, you want to enable anyone to do anything as a, as a natural tendency of an engineer. But when you want to simplify things, you really need to kind of ask the question, you know, like, what is the 80-20? Uh, this is where it's like the Python ethos of batteries included, right? So what can we, uh, you know, how can you make this easy as possible for the pr most, you know, predator optimal kind of uh, set of people who want to use it? Yep, agreed, agreed, actually. So we are almost running out of time. So maybe a last question. Maybe, Stefan, you want to leave our listeners with some idea? Maybe you want to promote something? It's right time to do it now. <laughs> uh, sure. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, if you, you know, uh, are terrified of inheriting your colleagues' work, um, uh, you or you know, uh, this is where uh, maybe you're a new person joining your company and you're terrified of the pipelines or the things that you're inheriting, right? Um, I would say uh, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, you know, Hamilton. I think you know, but it is you could say we're still a pretty early uh, open source project. Uh, very easy, you know, we, we have a roadmap that's kind of being shaped and formed by inputs and opinions. So if you uh, want, you know, uh, an easy way to maintain and collaborate as a team on your model pipeline, since, you know, individuals build models, but teams own them. Uh, and I think, you know, that requires a different skill set and discipline to kind of do well. So come check out Hamilton, uh, tell us what you think. And then uh, from the DagWorks platform, we're still at the current, you know, at, at time of recording this, we're still kind of uh, current and kind of closed beta. Um, uh, we have a, a wait list, uh, you know, early access form that you can kind of fill out if you're interested in trying out the platform. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, search for Hamilton, give us a star on GitHub. Uh, let me know your experience. Um, would love to, you know, ensure that, you know, uh, as your email, ML ETLs or pipelines kind of grow, uh, your maintenance burden. So thank you for being thank here you. with us today and really good conversation. Thank you. <laughs> the ML Platform Podcast was brought to you by Neptune AI. If you'd like to learn more about ML platforms and ML ops, check our blog at neptune.ai slash blog. Follow us on LinkedIn or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, check out how we help teams solve MLOps challenges with our experiment tracking at Neptune.ai. To get notified of future episodes, follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening and see you next time.